I am recording now. Again, I'm trying to figure out how to make me the main person. Speaker view. No, that's not it. Okay, I'm just not smart enough to always know how to do this. Okay, so I'll try my best. Stop doing this. Okay, I'll try my best to um, No, I don't even know what that means. Okay. Um, so wait, let me try that again. Okay, so let me see if I can get a file loaded up. Uh, of course not. Okay, never mind. All right, so I'm trying to get the um, in the back screen this slide from your. Uh, everybody sees that. So I'm trying to get the slide that has all the information. This is the information you need to have handy as we go through the model, okay? So I am going to put me on speaker view. I want me as the main person. Um, spotlight video, yes. Does that work better? Hopefully, okay. So this is the model that corresponds to this information from your lab, all right? So the very beginning of chapter 21 is histology of the blood vessels, okay? So remember when we did histology of the heart, where's my hearts, all right? We went through that the innermost layer of the heart was the endocardium, all right? And the endocardium was simple squamous epithelium and areolar connective tissue. It's gonna have some fibroblasts, fibrocytes, some immune cells. It could have adipocytes in there. It can be rich in elastin and collagen protein. Then we went to the myocardium is the middle and it has rich in cardiomyocytes and there has to be some connective tissue in between them to make room for those capillaries to be able to merge inside there. Then we went to the outer layer and remember the outer layer is the epicardium, also known as your visceral parietal membrane. And so that's gonna be initially closest to the cardiomyocytes, some areolar connective tissue. We might see because of the yellow in some of these models, a little bit more of the adipocytes present, there's fibroblasts, there's still elastin and collagen tissue. And in these grooves that are created, we will see those major coronary vessels, okay? And then the very outside is our mesothelium, our simple squamous epithelium that forms that barrier on the inside of the pericardial cavity. And then the next layer out is your pericardial layer, parietal pericardial layer with mesothelium, a little areolar connective tissue, and then it blends out into a fibrous rich, like a capsule that we call the sac. All right, so that same concept of histological layer, epicardium, myocardium, endocardium, we are gonna take that and apply it to our blood vessel model, okay? Now, for the blood vessel models, three layers. So there's an undershirt, a regular shirt, and then an overshirt, okay? So the tunica intima is the innermost layer, tunica media is the middle layer, and the tunica externa is the outer layer, okay? So when you look at this model, the tunica intima layer is gonna have, just like in the endocardium, simple squamous epithelium, the endothelial layer that is consistent through the entire circulatory system. And behind it, shown in gray here, is gonna be that areolar connective tissue, that capillaries and fibroblasts and fibrocytes and immune cells and randomly you can get adipocytes and fat deposits in there, okay? Now, that's the, endo, or the tunica intima and it's going to blend in eventually when you're in the heart to the endocardial layer, okay? All right, sorry, gotta admit somebody. All right, then when you're ready, you go to the muscle layer. And in our um, vessels, the muscle layer is going to be smooth muscle. Now, 
Like cardiac tissue, the smooth muscle will touch each other. You see here in the model, they're arranged in a circular pattern, but there still has to be room in this layer for capillaries to come in. So there'll be some intermixing, like in cardiac tissue, some push in here and there of areolar connective tissue. So capillaries can get in here. There will also be some nerves that push into this because nerves can then influence these muscle cells to contract a little more or contract a little less, okay? So we'll have smooth muscle cells. And remember, smooth muscle cells are different from cardiac and skeletal muscle because some of them are going to be touching each other. Some of them are gonna be told to contract by the nerves, told to contract by hormones, told to contract by local factors like prostaglandin and histamine, all right? And then some of them might also have a little automaticity. So they could also be spontaneously contracting. Because they're arranged in a circle, they are gonna be this, they are going to, when they contract, cause the radius or the diameter, because remember the diameter is two times the radius, they are gonna make this vessel get a little bit smaller in its lumen, or if they dilate, they get a little bit bigger. The smooth muscle cells, actin and myosin, contract, they can stay in a contracted state. So if I have 100 actin and myosin, maybe at some given point in time, 20 to 30 of them are holding that state of contraction. So smooth muscle cells are constantly being told, contract a little more, more actin and myosin link up, contract a little less. They let the actin and myosin separate, all right? And so that's how I get small changes that can happen to my vessels. They can change just a little bit more constricted, just a little bit more dilated. And remember in our vasculature, the arterioles, which are the vessels sitting right in front of the capillaries, they are going to all be in some, on the systemic side, some state of constriction. Because the capillary to this finger, I might want to get point 0.05 milliliters of blood. The capillary to this finger, I might only want to get 0 0.03. The capillary over here, 0 0.02. Capillary over here, this finger's almost dead, 0 0.01. So the arterioles, think of it as the, the joint juncture at the end of my finger, those ca capillary arterioles right in front, they're gonna all be a little bit more constricted as you go down because when I send maybe one mil to that area, it's gonna let 0 0.05 here, 0 0.04 here, 0 0.03 here, 0 0.02 here. And how does it let that much blood in? Because of the state of constriction. So if I give myself something that makes all of those capillaries constrict a little more, do you see how, again, if I get 100 out of, a, out of 200 capillary, uh, arterioles to constrict, that's gonna make my afterload go up like we talked about yesterday. And if afterload goes up, remember, ESV is gonna go up, stroke volume goes down, and what should happen to cardiac output? It should if then, if nothing else changes and stroke volume goes down, cardiac output goes down, okay? So I want you to be aware of that smooth muscle layer, okay? And because there are a variety of things that influence it, that's why we don't have a one drug wander to get it to relax or dilate or just constrict. Because at any given moment in time, you have right now smooth muscle cells at every single arterial, at every single muscular artery getting influenced to constrict more or dilate more by multiple factors. Okay? All right. So the tunica media is going to be that muscle layer. Okay? Then the outermost layer, you can kind of see it here and it's white here. That's gonna be your tunica externa layer. That layer is going to be, again, very collagen rich. And part of that collagen fibrous outer coating is going to establish the like kind of plastic wrap around, this is my vessel. And then when I put my artery in my vein, because many of the arteries and veins run together with the nerve, they then have this connective tissue that can interweave and they can run as a unit. 
And then if I try to kink off a tube, it's hard to kink off a unit of three tubes running together, okay? So when I look at my, again, my arm and my, uh, you can't quite see them, but my veins and my arteries, remember they're running together. And part of the reason why kinking off takes a lot of effort is when you put three tubes together, for me to, everybody's done that. Like you, you play a trick on somebody and you take the hose and you, you kink it. That's a lot harder to do when you have three hoses running together, okay? Now, those are the three layers that we tend to see, like it shows you, in arteries and in veins. But remember, when we get to a capillary level, we only want the tunica intima level, right? We want the simple squamous epithelium, and we want the areolar connective tissue to kind of blend in with some of the surrounding area. So the blood moving through, carrying oxygen, carrying glucose, carrying amino acids, that can, for some of the leaking in and out, can then join the extracellular environment and supply those cells with nutrients and take away some of the um, waste products as some of it can then cross into the bloodstream, okay? But the tunica intima, that is always going to be present in arteries and veins. Above it, whether or not you have a tunica media or the tunica media goes away and you have a tunica externa is going to depend on which vessel you're looking at. So remember, arterioles are right in front of capillaries. So they need to have a tunica media layer, not a tunica external layer, when they get down to a small size. And part of the reason there is they need that smooth muscle layer of about two layers of cells around their intima so they can make those small constant changes to how much blood is going into capillary, okay? So on one side of the capillary, the arterial has a tunica intima, a tunica media. On the other end of the capillary is a vein and it's the same size about as the tunica arteri or the arterial, but it has a tunica intima. And instead of a media layer, because it doesn't need to squeeze and contract, it just has the tunica external layer. Okay. So depending on where you are at the level around the arterial and the vein, the small veins, whether or not you have the tunica media layer, the tunica external layer is going to be what side of the systemic vasculature you're looking at and at that what degree or what level of the vasculature you're at. Okay. Now, as you move up into the bigger vessels, we're going to notice differences. Look at the vein and its tunica muscular layer. Look at the artery and its tunica muscular or media layer. There's a difference. Remember that the arteries are going to be under more velocity of the blood flowing through them, more pressure because the blood is going to, again, from the left ventricle, pushing it in, have a little bit of force behind it. That's going to hopefully be enough pressure or force to get it to go the length of the body, go the, through all the different radiuses that are presented. All right, and overcome the flow velocity issues and the viscosity issues. And then the other factors that we randomly kind of forget about sometimes, okay? So the veins on the other hand, when the blood has been through all of these levels of the vasculature, it's bled off some of the, again, like a marble. If I roll a marble, friction and just the force is gonna slowly bleed away, right? So at some point, the marble kind of slows down in the amount of energy it has to expend. The blood's the same way. When it's in the veins, it's, it's making its way back up to the heart, but the pressure and the force it's pushing on the walls around it is not to the same degree as the artery. So it doesn't need as much vein, uh, muscle around it, okay? So one of the things we're gonna see the difference between the veins and the arteries is the tunica media layer is less in the veins versus the artery. Second big difference we're going to see, the valves. The tunica intima and the simple squamous epithelium are going to form valves, all right, that are going to, again, for pressure gradient purposes, they are going to try to create, instead of me trying to get 
blood from my hip to my heart, which is one long tube, I'm gonna make that tube into lots of little mini compartments. And so when I'm creating a pressure gradient, I'm only trying now to create a difference in pressure between here and here. And if this guy area down here can be 0.1 millimeters more in pressure than this guy, which way will blood go? Up. And then the valves will keep it from backflow. And then if this area can get a little bit more, again, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.2 millimeters of pressure more than this area, what is blood going to do? Shoot up. Okay? And that's how I'm trying to get in these little tiny compartments slowly fractions of blood to where the right atria accumulates somewhere around 60 to 70 mils of blood out of five liters. Okay, a very small sampling of that five liters into the right atria. So then eventually it ends up in the right ventricle and creates my EDV with combining with my ESV. All right, so those are two of the big differences and the importance of them the valves are part of how the veins are helping to bring blood back to the heart. The muscle on the artery side being more robust is how the artery can manipulate the uneven distribution of blood flow to the different areas of the body. Because again, right now, does my leg need as much energy as my hand that I keep flapping around? No. So I need these muscular arteries and these muscular arterial areas to constrict a little bit more so less blood goes to the areas I'm not using and more would go to the areas that are more metabolically active, okay? That's the difference between the lungs. In the lungs, almost every place you have air coming in, what do you want blood to do? Go there. And so almost all of your arterials in the lungs are open, not a lot of resistance to flow because we have good airflow coming in. It's only when the lungs start to have problems and you start losing amount places in the lungs that do air exchange that the pulmonary arterials have to start shunting away. And that's when you start to see the right ventricle having to then push more force because now it has more afterload and you can start to worry about pulmonary hypertension. Okay. The other differences between artery and veins, let's look at those major arteries. And again, this model is wrong over here. But if we compare this to this, what we're gonna see is that in our major arteries, this white meshwork shows up here and here. And that white meshwork is supposed to represent at the end of the tunica intima and where the tunica media starts, as it talks about in your slides, that this is an elastic rich area. So there's a lot of elastin protein. So the fibroblast and fibrocytes in here created a lot of elastin proteins. And they did that again here. And the importance of this internal and external elastic membrane is it gives my larger vessels a lot of elastic property so they can potentially stretch out a lot or recoil back down quite a bit as the blood flow coming in. And remember the aorta, the common carotids, the vessels closest to the heart, they're getting big boluses. If you start making your stroke volume, you know, almost double, they're gonna start seeing a lot more fluid come at them and they need an ability to really kind of expand out or constrict down. So those internal and elastic membranes are going to be present in your major arteries to help them in their ability to expand and contract. The other thing the slide's going to talk about is as you go down in veins, as you go down in size, the muscle layer goes away. But what you're going to find mixed in to your tunica external layer are gonna be small little areas and pockets where smooth muscle shows up. So even though veins are not gonna necessarily still have a tunica media layer, they'll still have intermixed smooth muscle cells in there. And again, remember those smooth muscle cells can take a little bit more contraction by nerves, intrinsically, uh, uh, hormones, and other local factors and drugs to influence them. 
So some of our veins might still have a little manipulation ability, even though they don't have a muscular layer because of the muscles that are intermixed in their tunica externa layer. The next thing you're gonna notice when you look at arteries and veins, because of the robust muscle wall, and it kind of shows it in the picture here, there you go. Arteries tend to maintain that circular lumen type shape because again, they're used to being pushed on and pushed against by the blood and they've developed a nice muscle wall. The veins on the other hand, ee, there's my finger showing it, all right? They're trying to show you that the, because there's not as much musculature, they might kind of get bent, compressed and flattened. And so their, their lumen might not look like a pretty circle, all right? And that's okay. And so when you look at, again, the tunica intima layer, in a vein, you're gonna see the endothelial cells kind of flattened out on the side and then they'll push in and make their valves. Where in the, and I don't know if you can quite see it, all right? Whereas in here on the artery side, there might be kind of like some hills and valleys to the tunica intima layer. As again, that recoil effect, they might have, have a little bit of like less stretch. So they kind of ruffle up inside, okay? All right, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Again, there's a table, whoop, table, I'm gonna do this backwards. There's a picture to try to influence, again, what are the three main layers? How do the three layers change as you go from systemic arteries to systemic veins? As you categorize the major arteries or elastic arteries, and they're gonna have that internal and external elastic membrane, as those membranes maybe go away, but you still keep lots of muscle, you're gonna see your muscular arteries. This, this level, this is where the rest of the lab of labeling the circulatory major org, um, blood vessels, these are the levels you're labeling. So you're learning about the brachial artery, the um, radial, the ulna, the femoral, all right? the different parts of the abdominal, the ventricle or the vertebral, the thoracic artery, the bronchial artery. You're learning about those arteries that fall somewhere. In some cases, they're this category. Some cases, they're this category, all right? The arterioles, everywhere you have a capillary bed and you have a lot of capillary beds, there should be an arterial in front of it. And remember, every time you push blood out, your goal is to get blood to the capillaries. Well, in front of the capillaries, the arterioles are how you say, you get this amount, you get this amount, you get this amount, and it unevenly distributes it, okay? And they have to be able to change. So remember when we talk about blood pressure, small changes to the large number of arterioles is gonna have a huge effect on afterload, on our blood pressure, all right? Because small changes to the radius of a, quite a few of those arterioles is a big change to what the ventricle has to push against. So anytime we wanna make small changes to blood pressure in the short term, the most effective way to do that is give ourselves something that if we want it to go up, constricts quite a few arterioles. And if we wanna make afterload go down, we try to make the arterioles of quite a few of them dilate, okay? On the vein side, if we can get more push on the veins, remember that's gonna be veno-constriction. That usually is the muscle, the compression can't result to EDD, you know, like EDD, where if you somehow lose that muscle pressure on the veins, lose that, that vein, become more defined, relax, veno-dilation, it's gonna be harder than get that blood coming up, coming up, into the right nature, and EDD will come down, okay? Normally, when we talk about constriction of the dilator blood vessel, we normally have to say systemic, systemic, we just say trick or wrong, and you have to assumption that you know we're talking about systemic arteries, right? But it is a practice to say it's a systemic veno it's a systemic veno dilator. It's a practice to say it's a veno dilator, veno dilator, veno dilator, something only to pass through the pulmonary system to say it's pulmonary, veno dilator, or pulmonary is a dilator. Normally, when you talk about the system, it's a no, it's systemic, and then you go into arteries, materials. All right, so all I have for you today. Um, so again, when you like this model, the different this model is at two different layers. At the end of the image, you're going to work out the closet. The fat closet comes from the LDL, or you work on fat. They're going to bind to LDL receptors, and the fat that is stripped of cholesterol. Um, three diagonals. We'll get into that two-step intimate arterial connection. Maybe on the short term, it's kind of good because if the cells fall off, the fat behind it will create a plasma lot to keep blood from you know leaking into the area. 